Hello, my name is Casey Tift, and today I'm going to be giving a short devotional based on a book our pastor wrote called A 39-Day Walk Through Ephesians. Um, each uh, day, list some passages from Ephesians, and then uh, we have a devotional based on that. I am going to be doing day 36, which is Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. I'm going to start off and read the verses, and then we'll go from there on the devotional. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will to, as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. So this passage from Ephesians talks about uh, the way we behave as either a servant or a master. Um, it paints a picture of earthly masters and servants, all being servants under God together for his glory, and uh, serving each other rather than competing for selfish and worldly gains or things like that. Um, in his book, Pastor Mike mentions that obviously we don't, at least in America, have a lot of master and servant slave relationships anymore. Um, the most common thing we have that is similar to this is the employer employee relationship. And, uh, so that that is a, a good practical way to look at this, uh, scripture for our daily lives. Um, he goes on to list three reasons that uh, uh, we should serve our employer, our employees, um, depending on our role, uh, as we are, as we would serve God. Um, the first of those reasons is that it comes from verse five that we go about our earthly work with an attitude of serving Christ and His kingdom from the heart and with a good will and sincerity. Um, should be sincere and consistent in serving God Himself and not for show to the right people. Uh, and that makes sense because God's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He knows whether we're serving him or not. Uh, you can't really fool him. So um, in this, we have support from other scriptures. Uh, one passage, 2 Corinthians 1 through 12, kind of shows that the apostles followed this and they can be our example. Um, Paul writes here, he says, For our boast is this, by our he means the apostles, uh, the testimony of our conscience and that we behaved in the world with simplicity and holiness and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. And by you, he's addressing the church in Corinth and kind of by proxy all the other churches as well. So this is an example that of service and sincerity um, can be applied to both employees and employers. Uh, as the apostles were servants of God, but then they were also people of authority in the church. However, they viewed themselves as serving the people in the church. So second point, you know, we have a first point was we serve sincerely from the heart. We serve Christ in our work. Uh, he is the ultimate boss that we have, uh, whether we are an employer, an employee, um, all of us are underneath God. Um, second point, uh, God will reward us for rendering uh, good service to him in a sincere way. Uh, that was from verse 8. Uh, Romans 2 verse 6 backs up the idea of rewards both for good and non-good <laughs> sinful service. He says, uh, He, God, will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, he will. there will be wrath and fury. So clearly support here that God rewards our attitudes and actions. Um, and he also shows that the actions that are rewarded, what are we seeking for? Glory and honor and immortality. And, and by glory and honor, he means, excuse me, God's glory and honor, not not our own. That's a good point to mention. 
Um, another area in scripture uh, that talks about reward and sincere uh, uh, for sincere practice before God uh, is Matthew 6, 1 through 5. And this is Jesus speaking here. Um, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not like, be not, do not, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So, very strong explanation about, and some two examples about how when you seek the reward of making others, of others, you know, approval, Strictly that, if that's your priority and that's all you're seeking, then that's the reward you'll get, and God won't be involved. He, he rewards service that is done directly to him from the heart. Um, I believe that there are often mixed motives when we serve at work. Um, we can both serve our employer, and through serving them, we can serve God as well. And so there's sort of a chain of service there. We're not only serving one or the other. Um, so I think in this case, the issue is priority. You know, our, is our priority to serve God and then our employer? Or is it the other way around? Are we trying to serve our employer in a way that's not sincere so that we can gain rank and maybe a better paycheck only? Or are we actually doing good work to God all the time when no one's looking um, because we really want to be a blessing? That seems to be the key difference here. Okay, so we've talked about sincere service to God in our work and to our employers, um, and for employers, service to uh, their employees in a sincere way, um, and that that is rewarded, whereas insincere service or just kind of people-pleasing, um, not rewarded by God. Third point uh, Mike makes in the book is that we recognize God's authority by obeying and serving our employer or our employees, depending on our position. Um, and that has to do with the fact that God puts certain opportunities and positions for us in place as part of his sovereign will. And uh, we accept his authority by doing well in those places that he puts us and not resenting them. Um, so... For employees, there's a verse, uh, some verses here, Romans 13, 1, 5, and 7. Uh, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, Respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So here Paul talking about it's God's, God puts the people in authority um, and he's, he's, his sovereignty sets this up. Um, and so we generally are obeying him by serving our employer. Now, there's obviously some exception here. If our employer or if authorities are not serving God, um, then we need to serve God first and foremost, and we need to decide how to do that. Um, there are probably better ways to do that than others, but I'm going to not enter that discussion as part of this. We've got enough here already. Um, so for the same point, recognizing God's authority, um, for employers or rulers, uh, Matthew 20, 24 through 28, uh, has some good support. Uh, and this is Jesus speaking. You know that rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
So employers, you've got Christ's example to follow, an example of service even to the end of his life uh, to pay for our sin. Um, he talks about serving those underneath you, serving those who need your help. Um, that's really what this means. Obviously, Scripture supports and accepts the fact that some people will be in authority over others and that God is in authority over all. But he says you're not to lord it over them. You don't, you're don't. you not worth more uh, and you're not to treat them as less. Uh, you're to serve them just as Christ came and served humanity. Um, and verse 6, or I'm sorry, verse... Yeah, verse 6 also talks about that. You know, it talks about Ephesians. Talks about, um, I'm sorry, it's verse 9. Uh, talks about, your master is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. He's the master of both you and your employees. So uh, there's an equality there of value, uh, of human value. And you can recognize that by serving them and making good choices for your company and for your employees and for yourself. I think is what that means. Okay, so those are the points that were gone over. Um, I think a lot of us uh, really struggle sometimes to see these through. I, I, I know I do. It was actually difficult to give this devotional because I've been struggling with some of these things lately um, in my work. Um, right now I'm in an employee position uh, and... I have been somewhat of an employer or at least in a position of authority before as well. Um, but there are some things that no matter what position you're in, I think a lot of us struggle with. I do as well. Uh, I think one of them is that our natural and sinful desire to build ourselves up in the world or gain earthly rewards, kind of, that's our habit. We get stuck doing that and then it causes its own problems. Um, Romans 1 verse 25 Paul talks about, uh, well, I'll just quote it. He says, They exchanged God's truth for a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And he says they means people in general, I think. Um, do we worship the creation? Do we worship the work of our hands? Do we worship stuff or anything else in the creation rather than God? Do we prioritize that over God? I think it's tempting and it can be easy for us to do. We have sinful habits. Um, the world is right there in front of us, visually speaking. Um, and I think our attitudes to appreciate what God has created spill over into almost worship a lot of times. Um, and worshiping our own work is one of those things. The world is a tempting place. Uh, but God also has set it up so we get taught that it's tempting, and if we worship it, it rarely satisfies us. It doesn't last. He's got it set up for life and death to occur constantly. Things are constantly being broken down and rebuilt and redone. Um, 2 John verses 15 through 17 warns us about this. It says, Do not love the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So you worship something that's passing away, it's going to be frustrating and depressing and seem futile a lot of times. And I struggle with this. It's something I find in my work a lot, and I think a lot of times I just get on the wrong track. You know, I want pleasure out of the things that I'm doing at work and I'm prioritizing that over serving God at my job and it's easy to fall into for me you know it's uh, I imagine it's easy to fall into for a lot of people um, we have uh, some examples of that you know your work might go unrecognized no one ever knows that you did something awesome uh, or an org doesn't care uh, they might even recognize someone who didn't do much instead of you happens frequently um, you may have done a great achievement at work and it's being used and then it's either dismantled or outmoded very quickly. Those both have happened to me. I work in the software industry and you can develop something great, but the technology gets upgraded. Your thing can be kicked to the curb quicker than you'd ever expect. Um, and I've also had cases where 
product was being used, but someone above me decided they weren't going to use it anymore. And it didn't matter how much work we put into it or whether it was seemingly a good product for some of the users, they weren't using it anymore. All sorts of things like that happened to many people. Many famous authors and artists were not famous in their lifetimes. So they did great work. It wasn't really recognized at the time, and they maybe suffered for that. Uh, that's not uncommon. Um, so these things are tough to deal with, um, and it leads to a lot of discouragement. Um, it's both a lesson from God, but it can be a discouragement if you're not getting the lesson to switch over to a godly type of service in your work and looking for godly rewards. Um, I think we're just so used to the worldly rewards that we get, really get stuck on them. And once we get stuck in that, you know, there are evil forces in this fallen world that want us to think we're worthless. Satan is mentioned in scripture as accusing us before God of our sins. I mean, we're constantly making mistakes. and Some of those are sinful mistakes. And unless we fall to our knees and ask for forgiveness and repent, then those mistakes kind of stick with us a bit. Even sometimes when we ask for forgiveness, we, we have trouble letting them go. Um, Ecclesiastes is a, a book in the Old Testament that deals a lot with worldly stuff, stuff that is done under the sun, and he, he, uh, he, I think he gets it. In, in, in Ecclesiastes 1, uh, verses 3, 8, and through 11, he says the following, uh, and this is Solomon who wrote this, What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has already been done in the ages before us. And there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet, to be among those who come after. So, really just talking about how... <laughs> Things are futile, and there's no long-term gain from this kind of worldly thing. I think really it's God designed it as a system to teach us and not be attached to it, despite our best efforts. Um, but it does make it difficult. It's very discouraging, and it's but it forces us to try to change who we are and what our priorities are, where we're getting our rewards. Um, so. Being able to understand and realize the fulfillment of godly rewards, on the other hand, God's direction, his promises, uh, it takes a lot of continuing difficult effort because we have to change our habits and how we look at reward. Um, and I think a lot of times we reject it because we just don't want the challenge. We're tired. We don't want the training or we think we can't do it. Or maybe we've been burned by disappointment in the world and we misapply that disappointment and cynicism to the things of God, that can happen too. I think I've done that as well. Um, so there's some scripture to support this as well. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, Jesus says here, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are by, by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way that is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So he's, you... Focusing on a godly life is entering by that narrow gate. And it's hard. He says it's hard. but So why does God set it up to be hard? That's a, uh, a good question. Um, and I think, you know, God wants us to, he wants to push us. To do anything in this world, to achieve things you need to practice and make mistakes and struggle. Uh, almost everything is like that that's a significant achievement. So even worldly things have that somewhat characteristic. But you know, godly things spiritually have that characteristic, whereas a worldly thing might physically be hard, but spiritually we may be more comfortable with them. And so we have to apply this challenge to the spiritual side. Um, we need to renew our mind. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, uh, he says, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, meaning other Christians, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
So if we want to strive after the good, the acceptable, the perfect to God, the things that last, we got to be transformed. But he says that it involves testing, discernment, and offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. That does not sound easy. It is not easy. And it's not supposed to be easy. I mean, God clearly set it out that we would accept a challenge and ask him for help. It says, do this by God's mercy. So that kind of keeps us from being proud. We have to be very humble and just stumble along this hard path. But God does promise to reward us. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, let's see. I think accepting that God allows many tough circumstances for training and discipline of your mind, body, and spirit is something that helps as well. I mean, you, you have to have the right expectations going into this. If you expect that it's going to be easy, well, the world is going to be tempting because it, it offers this false sort of easiness. Um, and, and sometimes we know this, but we just need to remember it. Uh, Hebrews 12 gives us some of that, uh, verses 3 through 7. It says, Consider him, meaning Christ, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? He quotes scripture here. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then in 11 through 13, he says, For the moment all discipline seems painful and rather than pleasant, but later it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping heads and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight the paths of your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Verses 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So Hebrews talks about this being a struggle, and not for the faint-hearted or the weary. And he said, but he says, you're being treated as part of God's family. It's a mark of acceptance and salvation that you struggle this way. And so that should be encouraging. It is sometimes counterintuitive. You know, we feel like for being treated well, things are easy, but you need know, to think about it. Like there are jobs that people want, like being an astronaut, let's say, and only a few get to do it. And those few are the ones who train the hardest. They're accepted, but it's also because they've been willing to rise to the occasion. Um, uh, let's see. He also promises that we've received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So we have an eternal reward. The other scriptures mention this too. And that's encouraging. That's the type of godly reward we're looking for. Something that's not going to go and fall apart or be taken from us. And God does promise that as a reward. I know it's often hard for us to see because we're so tuned into this world. But scripture does offer these promises. I think... It would be a great study to look into these promises more and get a better grasp on them. It's something that I could do and improve as well. Um, so I would encourage you all to do that. Uh, and I thank you for your time. And God bless you all. Goodbye.